Hello and welcome to the last episode of season one of Benchmark and Transition. In this episode, we continue to look at the LIBOR fallback, and in particular, we focus on the value transfer and the difference between clear and unclear market. And as usual, enjoy the show. LIBOR fallback, value transfer, and in particular, cleared versus non-cleared markets. In the description of the contracts, we have on the non-cleared uh, side is the master agreement, which we discussed already. Currently, uh, the fallback are not extremely good, and there is a proposal to change to a better or a more precise fallback. And but those amendments will apply only to the new derivatives, to the derivatives traded after the amendment takes effect. And the legacy contract, the, the contract already traded, will not be affected by this change of definition. On the other side, on the CCP side, the CCP have the power to change or to decide of the rate in case of the rate is unavailable. But also they have uh, already announced that if ISDA is changing the, the fallback mechanism, they will change it also in a similar way, but in the case of the clearing houses, it will apply to both the legacy and the new contract. So the current contract will also be changed if there is a change on the CCP side. So let's look, let's look at this from a historical data perspective. And in this graph, I will start with the dark blue uh, curve. So this one, this represents uh, a spread for a basis swap, basis swap in dollar between LIBOR three months and uh, overnight uh, FENFED. And this is for a tenor of 30 years. So I take a very long term swap to make sure that it includes all the fallback. So what we see is that roughly two years ago, the spread was around uh, 45 basis points. Then there was the start of the discussion at ISDA level and the dif different consultation. And after those consultation, the spread started to decrease roughly to one year ago when it reached 25 basis points. And since it has been roughly unchanged at this level. Can we understand that? Yes, those swaps that are quoted in the broker market are for cleared swap. That's the liquid market. And if we compare that level to the level of uh, the uh, spread that we have computed already, the historical median is around 25 basis points, and that's what is represented there on the bottom right by those uh, dark gray or almost black curves. This is the uh, five year median computed at different dates. So, this is to show that the current market for the 30 year swap, the basis swap, is roughly where the historical data is. This is not surprising. Again, those uh, levels will be embedded in the new in the existing trade in the cleared uh, market now what is happening for the swaps which are not uh, impacted by the fallback and for that i i can look at the other curve which is uh, the light blue so this color which was roughly two years ago at the same level, then move a little bit up and down and came down to maybe also 25 basis points. But certainly in the last year, we can say, see that it went up, down, and with the crisis, a lot up, up to uh, plus uh, 60 basis points. This shows that the market does not believe that there is no risk embedded in this spread. Certainly, up to one year, we see that uh, risk going up and down. But on the other side, what we looked at first, the very long term, this risk 
is not present anymore because it has been replaced by a fixed amount, this five-year median. So let's look at it uh, from a, a formula perspective, which is the following. So the top one is the formula we have already discussed, which embed the fact that we don't know what will happen on the uh, swap bilateral with the current definition. There is also the discontinuation date. That's the date on which this problem will appear. On the other side, after the new definition, what we will have is, again, discussed for a long time. We have the spread uh, on top of the overnight. That will be the replacement. And this will start after the trigger, which in the case of precession is an announcement uh, by the regulators. So now those two formulas, those two formulas are uh, quite different. And there is the third one, which is the one for the cleared market, where the, the plan is to use a similar overnight plus spread. And there is also the discussion on when this formula, this new mechanism will, will come into play. There, it is not 100% clear yet if the CCP will take the trigger date or TA, the trigger announcement date, or maybe go back to the discontinuation date. So there is still uh, some uncertainty there. But for the rest of this uh, episode, I will suppose that the, the two formulas uh, for the clear market and uh, non-clear after the new definition are the same. So let's ignore the difference between those two. What we want to look at is the difference between those two. So what are the differences as discussed already? The big one is this question mark and also we have this uh, discontinuation date. Now, if we try to put that uh, into numbers, we don't have those information. Again, the question mark, the discontinuation date, the trigger date, and to some extent the, the spread. We don't have information about each of them individually. We have on the clear market all of them together in a certain way. We have information, but not for each piece individually. What we know also from the previous formulas is that the, there is a large difference between the new definition and the old one. That's why we moved the, the new one, because we don't trust the existing fallback mechanism. Now, if we don't sign uh, the protocol, if we don't move the old contract to the new definition, what is happening? Let's try to imagine that and do some kind of fiction to imagine what will happen if we don't uh, update the definition. We come to the fixing date of one of the payments, so the, this theta, that can be uh, in 2022, but maybe it will be 10 years or 20 years later. And we have to do a payment related to LIBOR. LIBOR does not exist anymore. It's not visible on the screen. What can we do? The only thing we can do with our counterparty is to agree bilaterally, but not very uh, much chance on that, because one side wants a lower rate and the other one a higher rate. So we go to a court or to an arbitrator to decide what will be the rate we have to use. So this judge or this arbitrator the only thing it can look at is what was the intent of the contract, LIBOR, interbank rate. That does not exist anymore in, in name, so we will look at some kind of proxy. What is the best estimate of that? I don't know what will be available on that date, so maybe in 20 years' time, but today, at least as an indication number, we can see 
the US bank yield index or also the proposal by some to compute spreads above uh, OIS based on CDS. So there will be at least a proxy that can give me an idea of where that rate could be, the proxy LIBOR. Obviously, getting an econometrical estimation of that is quite difficult. So, like in the ISTA case, I split that question in two pieces. One related to overnight rate. Why? Because this is there exists a liquid market, so I can, from the market, get a price for that. And then a second piece, which would be the difference between my proxy and my OIS. There, and that's why I need this proxy, there is no liquid market, so I cannot hope to get a fair price in the sense of uh, quantitative finance with replication of uh, the payoff. There is no replication because there is no liquid market. So uh, the best I can do is to have it fair in the sense of, on average, it will be viewed from today, it is zero. That's why I have embedded now this uh, economical uh, probability or physical probability to estimate what will be the difference between a proxy LIBOR and OIS. Obviously, this is difficult, and as we saw in the graph, then that can go up and down quite dram dramatically, uh, but that's what we need to estimate. So what we saw also on the graph is currently with the crisis, the spread is well above, uh, this econometrical spread is well above the level of the cleared market, which is based on the legal spread, which is the last, the median of the last five years. So now, if we summarize that, from an economical perspective, to have a fair uh, LIBOR, we need a proxy or a spread between the proxy and OIS. And from the data and from the graph, which is repeated there, we see a spread that can be quite higher than the quoted market spread. And just to have a very wide range, I say anything between minus 5 to plus 15 basis points. Why do we need that? For two reasons. When we trade today a bilateral swap, we cannot rely on the cleared market to have a fair price because the clear market is based on a completely different uh, payoff in terms of in case of fallback. So for if you trade today a bilateral swap, you need this estimate. And later, maybe more important even, if there is a proposal to move the contract, the legacy contract, from the current definition to the new definition, and this has been proposed by ISDA through a general protocol signature, again, this is not a neutral uh, mechanism. This embeds a, a value transfer that can be significant, let's say up to uh, 10 or 15 basis points. So this is important to have this estimate. And that's uh, the description of the, the requirement or the need, to my opinion, to look at the value of this signature was uh, presented in a comment in Risk Magazine in January this year. And the title of uh, the comment was Signing the LIBOR Fallback Protocol a cautionary tale. Once, one month later, in a speech, someone from the FCA indicated signing up the fallback protocol or face serious questions. So those two comments can be seen as opposite to each other, but to my opinion, it is not. What I recommend is not to sign the fallback protocol as such, but to look at a mechanism which is similar in the intent to obtain a clean fallback operationally, but to do it 
on a bilateral basis so you can discuss and review what are the valuation impact. So yes, certainly it will be, you will have to face serious question if you were doing nothing, but at the same time, from a valuation perspective, you would face serious question if you were signing the protocol blindly without uh, any compensation in one direction or the other. And with this, I'm coming to the conclusion of this episode, which is the fallback mechanism today is different between the legacy non-cleared uh, contract, the clear contracts, and on the third side, if you want, the non-clear with the new fallback, but those don't exist yet. They will start to exist uh, later this year, maybe in the third or fourth quarter. The liquid market today is the cleared swap. That's maybe 90% of the market or 95, but this is not a reliable, reliable information for the non-cleared swap. We need some non-standard pricing mechanism to price those non-cleared swap because of the lack of replication, the lack of liquidity. This is not a trivial impact from the data uh, shown on the, some of the, uh, the picture that can be easily up to 10 basis points for specific uh, cases, especially today with the crisis. The value transfer uh, hidden in this spread exists today when we trade a new derivative based on the current definition if we trade it at the clear market level and it will exist in bulk in big uh, part on the date of the uh, protocol signature if the protocol is signed uh, globally and there is no uh, bilateral compensation for it. As usual, the slides of the presentation are available at the address indicated on the screen and feel free to contact me for any question or any engagement related to the fallback.